Hi everyone, this is just a quick video on um, how to format graphs, particularly bar charts we're focusing on in um, SPSS. And what we'll do is focus on a clustered bar chart and how to format this, so just to tidy it up, but also so that it's suitable for APA formatting. What I'll do is run this on a data set where we've got, we've looked at this before, um, the effects of type of drug on Alzheimer's, cognitive performance in Alzheimer's. We've got uh, group one, which took a placebo, group two, which took an old drug, drug one, and group three, which took a new drug, drug two. So we're interested in the effects of these different types of drugs compared to placebo, and also we measured whether the patients had early onset or late onset Alzheimer's. So this is the second independent variable. Looking at whether these onset types also had an effect on cognitive performance, but also whether there was an interaction. Did the different drugs react or did the different onset types react differently to the different types of drugs? The dependent variable was the test score. That's the measure of cognitive performance on a cognitive standardized cognitive test. What I'll do is start off by running just the bar chart that we need, which is under graphs and chart builder. You get this message popping up, then you just need to click on OK. And then what we can do is select a clustered bar chart, which is the option down here. If we hold the left mouse key down and drag that up into the chart gallery box. The cluster bar charts are really useful for when you're doing any kind of factorial ANOVA and you want to take a look specifically at the interaction effects. If you've got a significant interaction effect, these can really help determine what's going on in terms of that interaction. Right, so once we've got this dragged up, what we can do is move for a bar chart. It really doesn't matter which independent variable you place in the x-axis and which you place in the cluster on x box here. So what I'll do is move drug down into the x-axis. Uh, onset type goes over into this box, cluster on x. Test score, the dependent variable, goes into the y-axis. And then if you move over, before you click on OK, if you move over to the right-hand side column, this element properties box, you'll see there's an option to display error bars here. And what we can do for these is place or display confidence intervals on each of the bars themselves. And confidence intervals are useful in determining whether you're likely to have significant differences between the different subgroups, if you like. So we'll select this option and click apply. You'll see it'll add a representation of these confidence intervals onto the graph. So we'll go into more detail in a little bit bit about what these confidence intervals represent. What I'll do now is click on OK to run that graph. And you should get the following chart up. So we get the following graph up. And then what we can do is go into the editor options in SPSS. And we do this by just double clicking anywhere on that graph. What you should do is end up with this chart editor. And this is where you can start to fiddle about with the graph in terms of tidying up the, the chart, uh, the backgrounds, changing the axes here in terms of the labels of the axes. We'll start off by just, at the moment, you'll see that there's a gray background on this. Now in APA formatting, it specifies that that should just be a plain white background. So if you double click on that background, what you should get is this properties box coming up on the right hand side. If it doesn't work, just try it again. Sometimes it takes a few times. And it's highlighted here, this grey background. And in the properties box, it has fill and border here. So if we go to this option here, where it says transparent at this point, click on that option. And then go down to this button here, click on apply. When you go back into the chart editor here, then you should see that that's just 
created a plain white background for this graph. So that's our first step. If I just click off that, you'll see that we're starting to tidy it up so it's suitable for APA formatting at this point. At the moment, you'll see that there's a line around the whole graph here, whereas really what we just want is a line for the y-axis and a line for the x-axis. So if you just click anywhere on that outline, it should highlight the whole outline of that box there. And then if we go over to properties again and click on this option border, and then click on the same button here to make it transparent, click on that, and then click on apply, it should get rid of that border then. So we're just left with borders for the X. The next thing we can do, and I'm not sure if this is an APA formatting thing or just one of my personal pet hates, but you can see that at the moment, the graph goes up on the Y axis to this value of 25. And then the line carries on after this point, which I always think is a little bit messy. So if you click on any of these values in the Y axis, so if I'll click on 25, it should highlight all the values of that Y axis now. And then going over to the properties box again, if we click on this scale option, you'll see right down below here, we've got specifying an upper margin of 10%. Now, if we change that to 0% and then click on apply again, it should get rid of that. So the axis or the values of the axis actually stop now at 25. Okay, now once we've got to this point, what we want to consider now is just tidying up the labels that we give to these axes here. So at the moment, the axes, the labels are just the variable names that we had in the FPSS data set, but sometimes we might want to provide a bit more detail about what these specifically represent. So what we'll do is if I single click on that mean test score and then just pause for half a second, single click on it again, you'll see that you can change the label according to whatever you want to label that as. So we'll call it something like mean Cognitive test score just provides a little bit more detail about what that variable is. And then if you just click anywhere outside that box, it will change that label then. If you go back over to the properties box, if I click back on that, sorry, if you click back on mean cognitive test score, go back into the properties box. What you can also do is change the font and the font size. And generally it's a good idea to use the same font that you've been using throughout the write-up. So if you've been using whatever font you've been using, if you just changed this font to the same type of font, you might also want to play around with the size of the font just to make sure it is easily readable. I'll do the same thing for the x-axis. So if I single click on drug and then single click on it again, it will allow me to change the name of that variable. And I'll just call that drug group. Click off that. And then if I click back on it, I can change that to font size of 12. All right, and then further up the graph here, we've got the onset type. One thing about the onset type at the moment is it's in fairly small, a fairly small font. So you might want to click on that and then change that font size. I'll change it to font size of 12 and click on apply. Uh, do the same with the label here change that to a font size of 12 and click on apply. And then looking at that, one other thing that you might want to do is think, okay, if we make that bold, 
just makes it stand out a little bit more. And also for the labels on the x-axis, if you click on any one of those, it will select all three. And the size at the moment is eight. I'll change those to 10, just see what impact that has. And yeah, that looks legible and easily understandable. Uh, the other thing to notice here, we've got this little box set here saying error bars 95% CI. What I'm going to do is get rid of that because we're going to add that to the title to show what the error bars represent. And basically these error bars are known as confidence intervals and they give you an indication of whether you're likely to find significant differences between the two groups. Specifically, they refer to a population estimate. So when we're calculating mean scores, such as the means for the placebo groups here, what we really want to know is how reliable, how likely that is to be the, a true reflection of the mean score in the population. And we can't be sure of that. There's no way of really being absolutely sure. But what we can do is add these confidence intervals to say that if we took 100 samples, then 95 of those samples, the mean scores will fall within the boundaries of these confidence intervals. So roughly you can translate that as we've got 95% confidence that the true mean score of the placebo group early onset Alzheimer's group lies within these boundaries. Now what we can do with these is we can use these to say Okay, for the placebo groups, we've got a high degree of overlap between the confidence intervals for each of the subgroups. For drug one, however, we've got no overlap. So we can be very confident that the drug one for the early onset group was having, was having a higher impact on cognitive scores compared to the late onset group. For drug two, it's less clear because we've got overlap now between the mean score for the late onset group and the lower boundary of the confidence interval for the early onset group. And it's always advised to use p-values in association with confidence intervals. A p-value gives us a more definitive answer as to these questions. But what you'll see is that this closely matches the simple effects analysis that we did on these groups when we looked at whether the subgroups now differ. Wouldn't worry about that too much. Um, just at the moment, think of this as it's an indication of whether you're likely to find significant differences. So the only other thing to really consider is the color scheme. Now, I'm not a graphic designer. I'm not going to lose sleep over colour scheme, and my graphs probably aren't the best way to visually represent things by colour. But there's just a few things to bear in mind. First of all, this is this looks absolutely fine. But if you were ever to print a graph out or a bar chart out in black and white, just remember that if you've got a colour scheme in the first place, you just need to make sure that that is transferable to when it prints it out in grayscale to make sure the differences between the early onset and the late onset group are distinguishable. So one easy way of doing this to still retain color, but also if you need to print it out in black and white, is I'm gonna keep the early onset groups as a dark blue shade, and I'm gonna change the late onset groups to a lighter shade of blue, so we've still got distinguishable bars between them. And we can do that by, if I click on any of the bars, it will select all of the bars in total. So if we tried to change the color, it would change the color for all. But if I then click on the same bar, it will select, you will see, the three bars just for the late onset group. So that then if I go over to the properties box on the right hand side and click fill and border we can change the color now of these groups for the late onset subtype and i'm going to change it to let's try this one okay a lighter shade of blue 
click on apply. All right, once we go back into the graph, you can see that it's just applied that. So it's very distinguishable when you do it in color. And also if you printed that off in grayscale or black and white, then you'd also get easily distinguishable lines between the two. So then now we're ready to transfer that to a Word document and then give it a title. So if you click off the chart editor, just cancel that, don't worry, it won't lose all of the changes. If you press that, you'll see that it will save all the changes in the output file in SPSS. And we've left with this file. What we can do now is click on the right hand mouse button and then go down to copy special. Sometimes I find that if you just use the copy function, it won't allow you to do it. So if you use the copy special, it will select, or it should select uh, the following options. So I'll click on OK for that. All right. And then if you open up your Word document that you want to place it in, right click the mouse and it gives you paste options. If you select the first one, keep source formatting, then that should paste that graph into your Word document now. Okay, and you can see that, yeah, it's just pasted that in. So the final step really is just to give the bar chart itself its own title. And the way this works in APA formatting is that we, so the label for the graph is below the actual graph and you can see that they're called figures when we're describing these things in APA format so this would be figure one and then you can give a meaningful title to whatever the graph represents and the only other thing uh, to add is what the error bars actually represent so the error bars here represent 95% confidence intervals so once we've done that we've got a graph which is in APA-ish format, I'll describe it. There's a few other little quirks of APA format that we're not going to cover, such as this legend here is meant to appear within the graph itself, somewhere around here, and all the other kinds of quirky little things, uh, but we don't need to worry about those. But this is more or less suitable for APA formatting, and hopefully, I think it looks a lot tidier than just what AP, the SPSS file gives you in the first place anyway. So this would be how to format this kind of bar chart for this kind of graph that you need. So we'll uh, leave that there. Thank you.